Coast Stouts. You know, it's it's people around me, you know, I'm at the store or whatever. And again, everybody's in short sleeves, shorts, you know, flip flop. And they're like, oh, it's so cold. It's so cold outside. Yeah. It's so cold. I'm like, yeah. We are spoiled. <laughs> So hi, and uh, welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And tonight, I'm going to ask Cyprian and Father, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? I don't have one yet. I'm still thinking. Yeah, you know, I think um, I, I have some, some go-tos. Like, I'm a big Rocky Road guy. Mm. Um. I like cherry ice creams. Cherry oh, ice cream yeah. is really good. Yeah, it's I really like, good. I like cherry ice creams. With big blocks of chocolate in there too. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, And, you know, I'm a Neapolitan guy too. Mm. Really? Yeah. A lot of people don't like Neapolitan. but kids are all, about, all about it. They're all about it. I'm My all about it. My dad used to love Neapolitan. Yeah, Neapolitan is really good. That's the one with the strawberry... The vanilla and then the yolk and then the mm -hmm. chocolate all in the mm -hmm. same. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm gonna say I like um the transgender colors. Co coconut <laughs> ice cream with pineapple. So any kind of pineapple ice cream, whether it's a pineapple sherbet, I like a coconut ice cream with pineapple. I'm I'm all in on that. Um or uh is there such a thing, Supreme? I think you've been on the jungle too long, man. No, 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 no. It's, it's, no. it's, yes, it's really it's good. Pineapple good. ice cream? Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, pineapple sherbet, first off. That's, that's, I will never turn down a sherbet. Okay? okay. If you give me a sherbet, I'm okay. all about uh, any kind okay. of fruit, gelatos, I'm into it. But there's a, what I like is coconut ice cream. So it's basically like vanilla ice cream. And then mm -hmm. I guess it's probably got like coke like dried coconut in it so it tastes like coconut and okay. then with pineapple chunks in it as well yeah. like wow. real pineapple right that's by far wow. that's my favorite i could eat that one all day but okay. um chocolate ice cream with like a peanut butter ribbon in it yeah, have you ever cool. had this type of ice like real peanut butter inside like the ribbon inside the yeah. chocolate ice cream yeah. That's baller too. Like I'll take I'll take that one as well. Okay. Those are my two. I think that's the very first time baller has ever been said on this podcast. I just want to throw that out there real quick. Maybe it won't be the last. <laughs> when I was um when I was uh, forced to live in Iowa, there's a, a very a pretty like locally famous um ice cream chain called Whitey's. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know how you still pull that one off in 2023. But I don't okay. know either. I don't know, but <clears throat> they had a uh, pineapple malt. What was out of this world? Mm. Absolutely out of this world. It was like every time I go back to Iowa, not that I ever really go back there anymore, but when I have to, I I, I definitely stop and get some of that. But I did not think I was actually really that big of an ice cream fan until we started talking about it, and I was like, oh wait, yeah, I actually do kind of like. But um, my favorite what is uh, there's this one type of ice cream called a uh, cookie two step, which Ooh. is cookies and cream and oh. with chunks of cookie dough in it. So it's cookies so and it's cream. cookie dough ice cream and cookies and cream ice cream. Th thus oh. the titular two step, the cookie two step, and oh. yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So that that sounds that sounds deadly. That yeah, sounds I mean, really I've I've definitely like for like my sister's birthday and stuff like that i think is the last time we had it um mm -hmm. we definitely like i and i'm not even really like i definitely have a sweet tooth to a degree but i'm not it's never like my favorite but like i sat and like destroyed some ice cream like i said definitely sat and destroyed some ice cream so father when you were in california or another time have you ever had like like middle eastern ice cream like rose water and some of those other 
some of those other ones like the closest Persian, I've come, Lebanese. Those the closest I've come is the Turkish ice cream. Yeah, Turkish. Or it's super sticky, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the same same style. They kind of like do this whole. Yeah, and then uh, you have one videos. guy that played like the tricks on you. You're like, yeah. oh. I'm going to drop yeah. it and like, oh, yeah. There was a spot in L.A. in Hollywood, really, really famous. And the the rose water, I didn't think I would like rose water ice cream, but this, I was like, wow, this is really good. It's like, but it's not something I'd go to all the time, but I was like, it's really, really good called Mashti Malone's. I don't know if it's mm. still there. It's like uh, maybe La Brea. I think it might be on mm. La Brea. But yeah, if there's anybody in Southern California... If Mashti Malone's is still there, go there and get the rose water ice cream for sure. I tell you what, you know, um, there's that place. Um, definitely, there's one in Frisco. There's a couple more around the Stinking Rose. Yeah, 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 yeah. And do they have the garlic most, ice cream? Yeah, one of the most garlicky, like garlicky things I had on that menu. The garlic ice cream. Really? Yeah, I mean, we had like straight. Um, sauteed garlic and butter you yeah. know just like yeah, eating yeah. straight spreading it on the bread whatever i had like garlic like lamb and like i can't remember like just it was just everything's garlic you know and they're like okay let's try this garlic ice cream and that that garlic and that ice cream cut through my whole like garlic meal it was you know i mean everything's just like garlic and that was just it was it was was it good though was it actually good I remember being. I remember. I surprisingly, mm. I I enjoyed it surprisingly enough. I'm not gonna say it was like, oh yeah, like I want to get it again, mm. but it wasn't like, oh, this is disgusting. Like, it it went beyond the novelty. I just remember it being. I remember it going beyond the novelty. Now it may have been because my whole oral factory senses were destroyed from <laughs> like all, all the garlic, you know. But hey, interesting. If yeah. I were a vampire. I would start a garlic like based restaurant just to throw everybody oh. off. I'm just saying, and then I would like I never step foot in it. Never know. Yeah, exactly. And I might keep my coffin in the basement and everything, just to kind of. So, um, I think no, there's. Uh, I'm blanking. That's okay. I had something to say about garlic ice cream, but I can't remember. Oh, oh, dang! That's what it is. Because Father, you've had the Betty Ray's, right? Like that. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, the, there's something on that because you've talked about that for there, there was a bridge made in my connect. There's a connection made in my brain like a couple seconds ago, and I can't remember what it was now. There was something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We're going to move on. Enough about ice cream, guys. Let's stop talking about it. Um, it, is a, it is a super interesting food, though, and it's also interesting how it seems like it's one of those foods that every, like everyone has an opinion on it universally. What, ice cream? Yep. And I feel like everyone also has memories associated with it. Are you sure? Um, yeah. Like that there's there's something where it's like, oh, yeah, what's your, like, what's your ice cream? Mem like, I vividly, it, and I wonder what it is. Is it is it the performative nature of it? Is it, like, especially like of, I remember my generation. Did did, did they have thrifties around where you Yeah, were, of course. Do you remember the thrifty oh, ice man, cream with the little... The yeah. little uh, yeah, and they would have the shot scoop. it out, yeah. yeah, and they would keep it in the water and like pull it in out. In the water, like, this yeah. this is what I'm saying, man. Like it's, I feel like for yeah. so long and across so many cultures, there's this like, ice cream is like this thing. I don't know what it is, but it's. Well, you want to like know a secret? I'll tell you. Go a secret ahead. Too. Go ahead. Uh, I I gotta give credit where credits due. I picked this one up from my friend Father Moses, mm. Father Moses McPherson. You know, just have a little bit of ice cream. You know, you're just you're in the middle of a temptation. It's kind of like ah. it's kind of like an uncouth, unsophisticated American's version of um, Saint Sophroni. Because Saint Sophroni, his his take on um, Saint Silouan's "Keep Thy Mind in Hell, Despair Not." Saint Sophroni would say, "Stand at the edge of the abyss. When it gets too much, have a cup of tea." You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so like the the like fat guy um American version of that from Father Moses McPherson's like I had a little bit of ice cream. And you know what? When it's just the temptations are just too much, you just you, you're gonna crack. Just have a little bit of ice cream, just a little bit. Sure. Just you know, just it's gonna be okay. I think on it's this podcast, okay. 
I read aloud, I think last week or something I bet about uh, the prophet Elijah was like on the verge of despair. Mm-hmm. And he had a nap and ate some food and suddenly things weren't yeah. so bad anymore. So that's right. Yeah. That's um, because we had a conversation a long time ago about halt father, which is the, the mm-hmm. you might be hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Tired. Yep. And that's why you're getting set off a little bit. And yep. you said it was like a form of humility of having to recognize, like, no, you're still like these things still factor into your lives much more than you want them to be, you know. So mm-hmm. like I yeah, I mean, I remember like before I got a little bit more serious about fasting, I remember being like so agitated because it's like, is every time I'm mad, does that just mean I'm hungry? So is this my, the rest mm-hmm. of my life is getting cranky, then eating and then getting cranky and then yeah. eating and then, and then yeah, fasting is like, much. well, you kind of push through that crankiness. There's something on the other side, you know, there's like a, a piece on, you know, call it ketosis, call it whatever. But like, there is this like this, like, oh, and like even on like nativity i was like i'm just not even really that hungry anymore you know like i at the meal afterwards it was lovely great time but it was like not even that hungry anymore i just kind of you know when to go to bed you know but well you know i mean that's the thing is that there's so much that we have to get to before we can actually dig into like actual spiritual work but it's still spiritual i mean it's still spiritual but like you know, it's kind of like a fast, like the fast begins. And I think we I might, we might have talked about this before, but it's like, I broke the fast. I feel I was like, okay, good. Now you're ready. You know, now mm. you're actually in it because, you know, this whole idea of like, I'm going to keep something based on my pure strength of will. I mean, it's noble, I guess, but the reality is, is you don't actually get to the real work. That's like, that's the shell that you need to crack to get to the nut. You know, it's like this whole... Oh self-sufficiency autonomy or like i'm a, i'm beyond that you know and that everyone has their kind of particular thing where they think they're beyond that you know like halt that's a good one you know um and there's other like physical things and there's all kinds of things we could probably get into that like people think like oh no i'm beyond that it's like you're not you're not above or beyond it you know yeah speaking of not being above or beyond before we get kind of into the meat of this episode I didn't clear this with either Cyprian or Father, but I'm just going to do this real quick. As a self-imposed penance for talking smack on people who had koi tattoos, koi fish tattoos last week. You got a koi fish tattoo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All all up and down my arms. <laughs> no, um, I actually, I'm just going to give real quick. I was thinking of two particular people. who Two particular people who I was thinking of at that moment. Mm. That's why I suddenly got so heated about it. But the point is, is I'm going to say real real quick three embarrassing things about myself that i did for the sake of being cool and all i had to do was think about it for like five seconds and they all came so like all because of the same quote unquote scene i was wrapped up in i used to wear girl pants where what is is that like it was skinny but it was back before skinny jeans were really marketed to men so the only way you could really really get like you can okay. see the change in your pocket, like tight jeans okay. was like by going and getting girl pants. And like, I remember like going and getting them and I used to turn my belt backwards with the buckle in the back for some reason. Cause that was what a thing. That? in the dots. I don't know. People <laughs> like the idea of you having like a solid white or whatever belt. Okay. And then the, um, I stopped wearing socks despite the fact, because, um, I just didn't think, and it was trendy to have your your like your pant and at your ankle, and you can see your ankle, the skin of your okay. ankle before it hit the shoe. You know what I mean? You can and, still wear socks, you know. Yeah, but see, this is this. Well, this is what I'm talking about. It's embarrassing. Yeah. I was too I I was too stupid or whatever to go buy those socks, and I have like up until like maybe my mid twenties, like the wretchedly like stinkiest feet even when i wear socks like me and my brother both we literally just by having socks would like rip through them like our our acid and stuff like that and our like in our, in our foot like sweat or whatever just like rips through the sock i don't know what's going on so the acid in our <laughs> for real never... it's like alien it's like for real it's like alien it's like hydrochloric acid coming this out this is of our... like the worst superpower 
No, you it's, have, basically. You, I have, mean, you have like the worst. Superpower. I show up to the X mansion and Beast finds out what like my X power is, my like mutant powers. Like you shoot just a little bit more acid out of your feet <laughs> than people normally would. And and it's probably just because of the massive amounts of like Mountain Dew and Red Bull and stuff I was drinking <laughs> in my early 20s. So that's in the feet. Yeah. I've but never this is the first time I've ever heard I have of, never of ever feet, needed a acid. pedicure. I have never ever needed a pedicure because my feet are silky smooth, all like oh, the acid. Because of the oh. acid. Because of the acid, because it destroys dead skin. Like, yeah, it's a whole Whoa. thing. Okay. So that's me bearing myself out there and saying right. something to this everyone. This sound very scientific. <laughs> I know I've never heard I've never <laughs> heard of anything like this, but all okay. Right. I mean, I could get on Google right now and be like <laughs> sweaty feet acid and see what comes up. But it I've 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 talked to a couple of people who've had it before. One dude thinks it's because of the amount of coffee he drinks, but he does like the same wow. thing. He destroys his shoes and his socks, just like specifically. And his feet were like really stinky when he was younger, like mine were. And but he just eventually it stopped. And it my feet aren't really that way anymore. So yeah, it's just a body chemistry but thing. But despite all of that, I still wore shoes without socks. And I like, I would just walk into people's house and be like, hey, uh, could you take off your shoes? And I'll just be like, well, I, I will like, see you well, later. Like, yeah, I cannot go into this either. house. So I will, I will see you later. I remember literally like I smoked cigarettes at the time, like blowing smoke on my feet to try and get my feet to smell like something different besides like just like nasty feet smell. So I just sit there and blow smoke on them. So... So I guess in the long run, getting a koi fish because it was trendy at the time is not really that big of a deal because you'd be living this guy's life. So, but anyway, speaking of halt and yes. how how things can kind of factor in, um, Father has been doing this talk um, on our catechism uh, at our parish about emotions and like how emotions interplay, like, you know, um, I'm going to give like the briefest of introductions about it. Um, but basically what emotions are, how they interact with us, what we're supposed to do with them and stuff like that. And I pitched the idea to father of maybe we could talk a little bit about emotions tonight, kind of what they are, how they work, what's going on with them. And um, I think father wanted to talk about one particular part of his presentation from his catechism before, or at least a launching I can, point. I can yeah. pull it up. So whenever. I've got it right here. There you go. Uh, yes. Can you guys see it? Yeah, we can now. All right. Okay. So, Father, what we got going on here? Yeah, so <clears throat> this is um, an icon of, uh, well, it's a, you know, icon-ish of uh, St. Uh, Lazar, uh, the great martyr king of Serbia. And this is actually from this wonderful like epic poem um, that uh, Saint Nikolai Venomovich wrote. It's called The Mystery of the Battle, The Mystery of the Meaning of the Battle of Kosovo. It's this incredible um, spiritual work. And so Saint, <clears throat> real quick, Saint Lazar, he, um, he was basically, you know, the king of Serbia and Serbia at this time was, you know, kind yeah. of like, holding holding the fort leaves like they were like the guarding um the last line of defense against the turks moving further into europe and so um they basically go to battle it's this it's this total um not quite suicide mission but you know they're they're vastly outnumbered and so <clears throat> czar lazar he um the night before you know he's he's praying and um, he's he's given a heavenly visitation, and um, from there he's basically asked, "Do you want the earthly kingdom or the heavenly kingdom?" And so Zar Lazar wisely chooses the heavenly kingdom. And so the next morning, early in the morning, um, the army you know rises and they gather. Um, they're they're all communed. They all receive the holy mysteries. And they go off to battle with the Turks and they are slaughtered. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the the kind of the scene picks up with Zar Lazar, you know, with a mortal wound. He's in the tent of the Sultan and 
he's kind of meditating on like what's happened you know like i i chose the heavenly kingdom why have we lost and then from there his heavenly um guide just basically walks him through the the calling to be the calling of the nation the people the serving people to be theoduls or to be you know servants of christ as a as a nation as a people and so he basically begins to explain to him you know that the choice for a heavenly kingdom um this is this is the price for it you know and so this section right here is coming from that and in that portion this this introductory portion he begins to outline to him some pretty incredible um catechetical um information and so this section right here where it says without this basic comprehension and distinction how can one comprehend what is happening to him in the world and how can the destiny of a people and all that happens to a people be understood without this basic comprehension and distinction of oh, the most valiant knight of this day no one among mortals can grasp what has happened today on this field of battle. And he says this to him in light of outlining a lot of really heavy theology to him. And so I, I picked this up because, um, as you can see, I put these two questions about, you know, do we see that we are in a very real battle? Meaning that the reality of our daily lives, the totality of our lives, um, we, we are often blind to, right? I mean, you wake up in the morning, you're worried about getting out the door, getting to work or getting to school or wherever you need to be on time. You're worried about fighting with your wife or your husband or somebody the night before. There's all these things that are that are going on. And so our lives are comprised of these like snapshots and those snapshots, um, they blind us from the totality of our life. And so part of the real battle is understanding that our daily life is this battlefield. Um, and the battle is really fought on this level of, you know, the inner life, but primarily for a lot of us, for most of us, it's in this realm of emotions. And for a lot of people, they'd be like, yeah, that's a spiritual life, a spiritual life. And like, yes, it is. And so um, ultimately what I'm not, I'm ultimately, I'm not saying that there's some dichotomy between like your emotional life and your spiritual life. But what I am saying is that um, for way more people than they might realize, they think that they're approaching spiritual life, but they're not because they haven't even begun to approach, you know, a modicum of, of what would be, you know, healthy human emotion and interaction with others. And that's because of how, you know, the, the fact of the matter is of, of how um, stunted, stunted, I was going to say retarded, but you know, <laughs> how stunted our, our society is, you know, and, and I think it's important to understand that, um, you know, um, my dad, which is like a lot of people's grandfather, even great grandfather, I say this the other night, his generation lived a more orthodox life, even though they weren't orthodox than a lot of Orthodox people who now who are in the quote unquote church, right? Just based upon the way that life was. And as we move further and further into the things that we call luxury, but really they're crippling us, really they're leading us into, you know, sloth and debauchery and all these things. It's actually making us more and more stunted emotionally. And so that, that is one of the big things in regards of, you know, playing in the background of what we're always talking about on our project here is, you know, the concern for people who are coming into the church, people who are new to the church, and there's just so much to navigate. And hopefully you want to navigate it because the problem is also is there's a lot of people who don't want to navigate it. And they think it's just about getting the right historical pedigree, you know, the right, um, quote unquote, kind of like religious political confession and that I'm good. Um, and so they never really get to this place, which this is what orthodoxy is about, which is, you know, the transformation of the inner life, the cleaning of the inside of the cup, not the outside of the cup. You know, the outside of the cup is all the things we're always concerned about, the externals, sociologically, economically, polit politically, like those things have their place, but that's the outside of the cup. The inside of the cup 
which is how you respond to your fellow man. You can't begin to even have a sense of devotion to God. How do you love, how can you love God if you don't, if you say you hate your brother? How can you love God who you've not seen if you hate your brother who you, who you have seen, who you do see? And so I think that this, I know that this is one of those things that's woefully um, overlooked at best. I mean, a lot of people, it's not even on the radar. They've never even thought about their emotional life in regard, or even emotions as something that could hinder spiritual life. They never thought about emotions as something that needs to be dealt with. And, you know, unfortunately for, you know, the growing number of people that are struggling with anxiety and depression, which dovetails into the growing number of people who are immersed in addiction um, and the kind of addiction that is dangerous because um, meth addiction, heroin addiction, those things are, are starting to become safer, if you understand what I'm saying, because the results of them are so much more obvious. Sure. You know what I mean? But the addictions that are growing with people with the pharmaceuticals and things like that, where people are becoming more and more functional addicts, you know, and the, the impact on that, not just biologically, you know, but internally in regard to their emotions and, and being able to really live a life that is, you know, uh, cognizant and aware of their the ramifications of, of their their thoughts and their actions this is this is a, a growing problem you know so um the key thing i guess one way to say it too is you know dealing with emotions is a lot like saying to someone you know um before you run you gotta learn how to walk sure you know, like truly you know so yeah so i think if you could in like two minutes or less because I know that is an extremely complex issue, but what do you think has led to like America, especially being so stunted or Western culture, I guess, should be as, as stunted as it is. Like, is it us getting further away from the penance, like the penance of humanity? Is yeah, it like, I think, I definitely think that's a part of it. I mean, um, I think there's a few things that have really contributed to what we're talking about. A big part of it is the way modernity has, been birthed in the West and impacted the West in particular, you know, um, there's something about how the kind of utilitarian aspect of, you know, life has, um, life in the West has become all about producing and mm -hmm. consuming, mm -hmm. producing and consuming, producing and consuming. Another way to kind of sum it up is, um in the east and really even in still you know parts of europe like spain for instance you know or even like the mediterranean it makes more sense if you, if you would say that they you know work to live versus here in the west in america you know and it, basically the, what is like when we say the west i'm talking like um british culture german culture um obviously north american because we're the we're the cubs of britain you know what I mean? So along those lines, we're talking about the West, you know, so it, Europe gets kind of, you know, those lines, you know, but for this context, but um, in the West, we say we work, you know, um, we live to work, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And everything is about work, everything from, you know, what kind of job are you going to do? Like, there's no concept of vocation. Everything's about occupation because your whole identity is wrapped up in being able to produce being able, you know, and even getting to like the Protestant work ethic, all those things play in. Yeah, like, like, where do you work as opposed to what do you do? Yeah, what do you ask somebody? You know, yeah, you like, it's it's, hey, my it's, name's it's Johnny. actually yeah, it's weird. It's weird though because that that I have found myself attracted, way more attracted to. Maybe this is an artist thing. Mm -hmm. but like i even noticed it today i just went over to a friend's house here but i've noticed it wow it's interesting that you would even bring this up because it just happened a couple of hours ago i went over to a a, a friend's house he's a local well-known family his mother was there his mother and father are older they're like in their 80s or whatever and like she asked me where do you work and i've and it's funny that locals here have asked me in the last month as I've taught, spoken to locals, it's now just clicking off to me, have said, where do you work? That's, that's the thing that they've said, where do you work? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, 
what do what you do, you do? Mm-hmm. which is always something that I would hear like you know like I'm right off the top of my head I'm thinking Echo Park in the mid 2000s when yeah. I lived there which was yeah. like super hipstered out For sure. you know what I mean the whole For thing sure. and it's like you would encounter people I never once heard anybody ask where do you work what do you do everybody would always say what do you do yeah, right? and, your had answer a job. Was, yeah and your answer was never what you it was right. like you oh job. i'm an actor i'm a exactly. musician i'm a dj i'm this you exactly. know what i mean i throw parties i i, I make clothes like what you know mm-hmm. and but i'm wondering if they're asking that because why else would i be here then maybe they're asking me that mm-hmm. because like what is this mainlander who's like two yeah. percent of the why are you here so you must be working for a government agency and then when i'm like Oh, I have a software business here. I do software. They're always like, they don't even understand. They don't even understand. But that's, it is very interesting that like they're assuming that about, it's kind of like I'm taking a step back away from it and being like, yeah, that's exactly how American culture is observed from the outside. Yeah, because that's right. It, is they're asking, it, where do you work? Because that's very obviously much, what's important to you. It, it's very much, if this makes sense, it's very much in the same kind of like, um, spirit of you know um clark kent is superman's is is kal-el's critique on human beings right 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 it's it's that's it's the same kind of experience like oh that's this is what this is what superman really thinks about us you know what i mean to blend in is like we're bumbling we're weak we're yeah. incompetent you know what i mean sure. and so when they say like oh where do you work <clears throat> They probably they wouldn't ask each other that. I I, I feel pretty confident. Absolutely. You know I mean, absolutely. So they, definitely... they would they would ask like, oh, who are you? Who is your family? Who's your family? Who are you related exactly. to? What is what is your last name? Exactly. Oh, are you related to the so? Oh, okay. Now I know you. Exactly. 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 Yeah. And this is like, <clears throat> excuse me. This is really key because it begins to give you a snapshot, which is really tough for a lot of us. Um, you know, like every once in a while I'll bring up like it's not morality it's not morality and I know people hear it and because of the nature of everything you know I'm sure there's some people that listen they're like okay what do you mean by that father like what do you mean by that because you know I say it every once in a while but this is one of those examples of there's this there's a real paradigm shift and you'll see this you know everyone talks about it in like kind of orthodox convert culture about like a paradigm shift but this is like a real paradigm shift. This isn't something you just kind of like pick up a word for and be like, oh, this is this. It's one of those things where you have to have some sort of actual encounter with a more either a traditional culture or you have to have some sort of experience where you're able to, as best as possible, get outside of yourself. And I mean, I don't mean you as an individual, I mean, as a culture. And just kind of like see for a snapshot, see how others see us. Like for me, that was when I went to Sarajevo. Like that was that was the first time, you know, went to Kosovo, went to Sarajevo, went to Macedonia. Like that was the first time I I had ever had a, an opportunity to step outside of being American and be like, oh, oh, you know, I, I'll give you. The, I mean, I remember we're in the airport. And I don't know what was wrong with me. I mean, I'm just being me, but I didn't even realize it, but I was being like fairly loud, you know, and kind of like obnoxious and I realized it. And then my buddy James was like, what are you doing? You know, like knock it off. Like you're embarrassing us. You know, and I didn't even like realize what was going on. But it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, because literally it was like some terrible 19, like 80s, like bad movie. It's like, it's everyone's smoking in the airport. It's super quiet, so oppressive, you know. God forbid you have some gas. Everyone's gonna hear you and just like, you know, here I am being like an idiot. And it's it's one of those it's one of those moments where I was like, it changed everything for me. I'd never had an experience like that. So you need to have th- these are the kind of experiences that help to kind of see, like, oh, okay. And then once you have them then certain things become a little bit easier to be um, kind of conscious of and how they can kind of um, get in the way of you understanding certain things that you think you understand 
you know, like when you read certain prayers or when you're kind of like, okay, this is how we do this, or you have it relegated to like, oh, this is just some kind of ancient thing we do. But really, you need this kind of experience. To be like it, it's it's very much a deep kind of like spiritual reality of not so much, you know, how the East is, quote unquote, but how really weird and messed up we are. You know, like I, I think I think that needs to be if you kind of have that starting point of, and it's not about, you know, I mean, it is what it is. We're Americans. I'm not, I'm not trying to, like, you can pretend to be a Russian or a Greek or whatever all day long. If you want, you're not, you never will be. Sure. You're not, you're never going to be a Russian. So, you know, once you face that, then you can really be like, okay, well, what does that mean? And then this is one of those things where, um, like you'll read stuff about, for instance, and I mean, why am I talking? Cyprian, you're married to a Russian. Like you should be teaching this class, you know, like the the emotional disposition of of an of American, of a Westerner compared to your average, you know, Russian is like so different. It's so different. Especially I, I mean, it's I think it's less noticeable among the women, but certainly among the men like well, i think women too but like even just even just the amount of like smiling and laughing that we're mm -hmm. doing here mm -hmm. like in a group of russian men we would be seen as insane mm -hmm. like why are you idiots what, what is like, so, why are you what are you smiling and laughing yeah. about what are you cracking jokes like mm -hmm. they'll tell it they'll tell a joke but it'll be like super wry and really rough Mm -hmm. So you'd be like, oh, it'll be the type of thing that'll make you go, whoa, whoa, really? Okay. All right. <laughs> you know? My wife. Like, and then they'll laugh. <laughs> then they'll laugh because they see you uncomfortable. Squirming. They and see you that's squirming. What's, that's what's funny to them. What's funny to them is that you're squirming. Then, ah, ha, 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 then everything. Okay. <laughs> My wife got really into like um, old money versus new money. And like, and we're definitely new money. Like America's just new money. We don't know how to act. Like, you know, if you could follow the metaphor for a second, it's like we're at the 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 ball or whatever, the great the great big thing that we're supposed to be at, right? We're at the party and like people who have been raised in it and old money, you know, like they know, oh, you don't drink that now. You drink that later on. Like, oh, you don't eat this. You don't laugh like this. You don't go talk to that person at this time. But we're over there just like rubbing our barbecue sauce and like the tablecloth and chugging beer and stuff like that. And kind of just passing out in the corner and everything. So well, as a culture, we've never been destroyed. No. Yeah. And and had to crawl our way back. Mm -hmm. That was like one thing. that's that's, that's what it. does it. That's what does it for you. Yeah. And I think that goes full circle to Zar Lazar, right? That it's that's like right. until as a people, you have been thoroughly wrecked you you're you're gonna act the fool it's it's every i I've, I've heard this from many many people over the years and like i think it's it's it definitely it definitely is true that like anyone that i've known and i've known a few people who are like you know 100 millionaires something like that not billionaires but like 100 million right they're like first million lost it all mm -hmm. first million lost it all they're like made a million lost it lost everything mm -hmm. and then and it's like only then are you able to be like okay and so it's like yep you rise to a height as a culture and then get just wiped look i mean look at japan they've been yeah. through it many times and they yeah. I, look at i mean russia yeah germany yeah even germany yeah italy italy yeah. over and over and over yeah. and over again i mean forgive me this is one of the things i just got to go there i mean but it's one of the great simultaneously for me it's the great tragedy of african americans and it's also the great hope because where you're going exactly yeah. because for african americans it's just kind of like okay on the one hand it's like yeah we're upset we're mad blah blah like that whole victim narrative all the stuff that kind of came to a boil it started in the civil rights movement and it came to a head in the summer of love, right? 2020, right? Uh, and and that whole movement is so tragic because it's like, okay, granted, all this terrible stuff, but it's like, 
yeah, that's like your first kind of like hallmark of maturity. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and the thing that's crazy is that, you know, up until the uh, civil rights movement, African Americans are doing good. They're, I mean, the the prosperity Very rate is well. incredible. You know, culturally, there was respect. I mean, think about Jesse Owens competing in in the games in Germany, and that whole drama with Hitler and having to just and the dignity and all these things. Like there was dignity there. And then father, boom. father, forgive me. Fewer children born out of wedlock by percentage in, in slavery. The, in Yes, and before the civil rights movement, yeah. all the way up to the civil rights movement, yeah. then white America. Yeah. White America had more children born out of yeah. wedlock yeah. than black America. Yeah. Up and until so, the civil rights movement. That's right. And so the thing is, what's crazy about that too is that, you know, and this is this is an unfortunate thing where it's like, and again, I thank God for being in the Serbian church because it's just one of those anecdotal things. I didn't need to be in the church to know this, but it's reinforced it and it's kind of given me like a a card to play with people not that people care or they talk with me but if they did you know it's this whole thing of like hey you know the reality is is that um you think that and i see this too with this the pan african things like oh it's, it's really because you know we're black blah, blah blah i'm like well actually not really because it's all about how you know essentially we've been since this time of of civil rights to now because it's like we haven't been taking our lumps like everyone, like, you know, with taking our lumps like a, like a big boy. Sure. You know what I mean? Like everyone else has, you know, because when I tell people, it's like, look, okay, look, the Serbs were enslaved by the Turks for 500 years. We did what, 400, 425 here in the States, you know? And even then, it's a completely different thing. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, because we didn't do it as a, we didn't do it as a unified people. We came mm -hmm. into it as all these separate groups, and then mm -hmm. this culture was formed in the slavery itself. Mm -hmm. And that's not different. even getting into the whole, which a lot of people just do not want to talk about, but it wasn't this monolithic white slave owners, black slaves. It's like there was plenty of black slave owners. It's like, and slavery is the whole thing. Slavery is the whole thing. So I just want to say this because that's the tragedy of it, but it's also the hope because okay, losing that first million. So if you want to flip it on its head and we really kind of, you know, the African-American culture has really botched it and it's really, you know, like a dumb adolescent kid got really into drinking, like discovered drink, however you want to look at it. And it's like, okay, hitting rock bottom. What, like what's going to happen now from the rock bottom? And because African-American culture is so young, you know, there's probably not much time. <laughs> I mean, who knows how much time is left in the world? But that that is what gives me some hope is that in this time of just, you know, hopefully learning to embrace the chastisement, you know, and, and this is why the Serbs are such a, a light to everyone, but the African-Americans in particular is that, you know, learning to take your licks for the sake of Christ, like that's what, you know, I think that's the thing, too, with like the black Hebrew is like thing. And I mean, we've talked about it before, but just real quick, it's like that's the seed of truth that they're kind of grasping onto, which is good. Like they'll say, like, OK, we, you know, quote unquote, we're the Jews, which is. Foolish, but spiritually, there's some truth to that, not not in a genetic sense, but spiritually, OK, anyone can can hook on to that narrative for spiritual purposes. Right. And so this this insight of like, okay, we're like the Jews, we're like the children of Israel who are being chastised. And it's like, okay, yeah, good. That's a good start. Like being chastised for not following God's commandments because it's just good to see the one thing that they do well is saying like, hey, you know, we don't take care of our families. You know, we're like this thing, like being out of wedlock, the poison of hip hop culture, the poison of this and that. It's like, yeah, I'm glad to see, you know, quote unquote, you know, African-American black voices saying that it's just too bad. There's all that other garbage that's tied up to tied up with it. You know what I mean? But but the, but it's a snapshot of something, too, because when you look at like hip hop culture, what do you see? Like the obvious thing of all the degeneracy and the debauchery, it's actually not the thing. Mm. The degeneracy and the debauchery is a fruit of something. It's a fruit of being emotionally stunted Do you yeah. what I'm saying? yeah yes. absolutely yeah. and that and that and that's like what you always see too 
right? That's what that's what it always comes down to. And that's why it can be scary too, because it, listen, everyone knows that feeling. Everyone knows that feeling. And, and it's, I remember my wife, well, I wish she was here. Um, she showed me this one like YouTube short. And you know, people will do like um, the one man skit thing. It's like, I'm the kid, I'm the adult. And basically it was like the guys doing like the kind of, what are you guys now? What are we at Gen Z's or whatever with the, right? Doing the Gen Z thing, like basically holding the mom hostage. Like, I don't want to do whatever. And it's like, oh, I'm so sorry that I asked you to take responsibility and take out the trash. How dare you, mom? You know, one of those things. But everyone has experienced the terror of the adult child. Yeah. Everyone's experienced it where it's like, you know, that one person who's just so emotionally stable and it's just kind of like, what are you going to do? Like, I'm scared to even breathe. I'm scared to say hello or good morning or can I get you some pancakes? Because I don't know if you're going to lose your mind on me. So you take that and you apply that emotional instability, that volatility on a, on a culture, on a community, and then you add on top of it, you know, guns or whatever else. It's just like, it's frightening. But the core thing there isn't necessarily the externals of like, you know, again, debauchery, violence, whatever. It's that emotional volatility. That's that's the problem. And that's praised a lot in like the hip hop community because yeah. like that's one of the of things is. like like I when I was younger, I was for as much hip hop as I got into, which is not a ton. I, I can kind of, you know, a little bit. Like, but I always remember, like, that was one of the things that Tupac was always praised for. And when I was younger, I remember liking Tupac better than Biggie. But as I got older, I started to like Biggie more because he just seemed more emotionally cool. level. Like, yeah, yeah, oh, not yeah. Cool very, like Fonzie, very, not yeah. cool like Fonzie, but more no. like, yeah, he's like, he's like, yeah, he may be mad inside, but he's not like externally showing it or whatever. I, I mean, you know, but like Tupac, like had like hit him up and like you know uh keep your head up like in the same discography you know like like there's these like and maybe that's not like the best analogy but, but like he, he was would... but even even just interviews of him or even just him just out and about anything you see recorded of him he's over he was over the top yeah you know, animated like at any given time he was he was just taken by his emotions and could fly at any exactly as father said like could just fly off at any moment like you don't know what's going to set. You up. don't know what's going to happen. It could that's be part, That's part of the cred. Now, I just want to kind of turn this on its head because this is where it's going to get real interesting. Andrew talked. Well, I don't know. Everyone might think this is boring. They already knew it, but for me, I think it's interesting. Andrew talked about old money and the new money thing. Well, you can trace all this back. Actually, there's this really great book I encourage people to read. It's called. Um, um black liberal no white liberals and black rednecks thomas soul thomas Sowell. very good very good book and he really does a great job of laying out the needed information resources of tracing his theories back and they're solid right but basically like all that come all everything that we're talking about it it essentially is old redneck culture an old redneck culture, right? Because if you think about like where these pockets are, right? And hood culture where these pockets are, they shared the same cultural values as old redneck culture. So they, these old Highlander, it's like the old Scottish, old Irish, the ones who didn't, so this, is, this is where the words get tricky. Not the old money, but old in regards of like way back there, the ones who didn't have the old money, right? So the poor Scots. That's why they immigrated. That's, that's why, they, why immigrated they immigrated to the US. Yeah. So they were commingling and mixing, and that's where they picked it up from. Because a disregard for education, mm -hmm. um, a disregard for sexual morality, mm -hmm. you know, and sexual discipline, um, the uh, lifting up as a value of sexual promiscuity, seen as virility, mm -hmm. violence. Mm -hmm. Who picked you know? up what from who? Sorry, I lost it. Who picked what up from who? So African Americans got it from the, oh, those sure. those immigrant yeah. groups. 
Okay, you know, I'm with you. That's where yeah. they picked it up from. Lower, they... basically lower class Irish and British and Scots. Scottish. Yeah, oh, yeah, the white people screwing over the black people. Like, <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> well, it's just it's it's well, it's the same. I forget who's. See, you don't. So Thomas Sowell is so good because he 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 actually he traces these things back, and then you go, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. I forget mm -hmm. who it was who. Maybe it's in Daniel. Maybe it's some crazy. It's like Daniel Quinn's Ishmael book, but like he po he points out that John Wayne, the laconic mm -hmm. cowboy, mm -hmm. the like, hey there, pilgrim, how mm -hmm. are you? That's a Native American affect, affect and accent yep. that he's putting it on. Is whoa, yes, <laughs> that's whoa. what so he's like. The laconic cowboy mm -hmm. is being a a an Indian, an American Indian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what that is. Like, that's what the cowboy Western, and it's just like, whoa, because you think, oh, that's cowboy. And then you're like, oh, no, he's actually not. It's the, he's imitating the successful group mm -hmm. of that area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's just going and looking at who's mm -hmm. got their stuff together and is handling business here. Okay, I'll act like them. Mm -hmm. Who's the hardest, who's the hardest guy? Who's the guy who's you're the, the most guy? afraid of? He's the who hardest the guy. the most afraid of? That's, that's who it. I'm going to be like. That's it. That's it. And this pulls into a whole thing with Gerard and Rene Gerard's understanding of like, you know, what you really want. You you don't want the beer in the ad. You want the life that the guy who's drinking the beer has. Sure. Sure. You know. Well, welcome to the world of Andrew Tate. Oh, welcome. Yeah. That's who he is. Yeah. He is a Gerardian yep. archetype. Yep. Yep. Man, that's it. That's it. That's it. And it's funny how, and this is, I think right now, a great example of where getting into the sociological, philosophical aspects of analysis are valuable insofar as it's not just kind of like tomfoolery and like, you know, all that stuff. It's actually pulling apart these real issues because again, I would submit, we can actually do something about these things, but you need to have understanding. Getting back to that slide, you need to understand what the battlefield is because people for as much as we talk about, you know, and it's all there, right? Like that big primer that we've, so if I could just step back and say, like, if you were looking at our conversation over our project, right. And this kind of like arc of principalities and powers and the, the overlapping and the interpenetration of the material and the spiritual powers and like removing the false dichotomies, like all the things we've been talking about. Right. So you get this hopefully to a point where the information and the way that you engage, it's almost tacit. You, you see what I'm saying? What does tacit mean? Um, tacit is basically like automatic knowledge. So it's like once you've learned to drive, when you start driving, you're like, okay, I must put my foot on the gas. Must oh, put my you don't foot even think brake. about it anymore. It's like, yeah, that's tacit knowledge. You just kind of like do it. So once you kind of get that down and you're no longer thinking, okay, is this a, is this a spiritual thing? Is this, you know, not once you kind of undo that and, and you really just, okay, you're just, you're in the zone all the time. That's when I think you can start tackling some of these things and start being like, okay, well, what does this really mean for society? So it's like, you don't need, and like, it's not necessarily about getting out there and becoming like the activist, but it is about, Okay, how are you going to raise your kids? Where are you going to send your kids to school? Are you going to start a school? What are you going to do about your community? How do you influence the group of men that you hang out with? Like, do you have a men's group where you guys just like sit around, talk trash, and drink too much beer? Or do you sit around, drink some beer, talk a little bit of trash, but actually do something? You see what I'm saying? It's all about these movements that they don't have to be these huge, sweeping things, but they're these movements towards addressing these issues that are corrosive to communities to individuals to families you see what i'm saying because father father, father forgive me forgive this me. is the, I, I i have to because I, I i do not want to lose this hmm. what you just said is like it's so very important because the the what i see is like before that before that point like so what holds what holds people back? Like in the modern secular context, like, yeah, people are meeting up, men are meeting up, whatever. 
and people would think like for, form over content, right? They think mm -hmm. like, well, right. we should all get together and we should all meet. And for the most part in my life, I've been like, I've learned, no, actually, no, nothing will get done. Mm -hmm. Like we should all get together and we should meet and nothing will get done. When does things get done? Things get done when everyone shares the same phronema. Mm -hmm. Like good. it's the only time is it because there's all the presuppositions that you don't have to go through. There's never any argument about like, why is this happening? Okay. Like the why of it is yes. never in question, but that if is... you're in the secular world, you get yes. stuck on the why. That and is... I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you something right now. Father, can I just say really quick, that is social work right there. Yes. That is being in the social work field. Let me let, let me say this, because this is really key, right? And you know, it's one of the things where every black person, if you say crap in a barrel, everyone chuckles, they know what they're talking about, right? This is why when people say, oh, come, you know, the, when you compare, let's say, a recent, a recent um, Latino immigrant community or family or recent Asian American community, like a recent traditional family that's immigrated, right? And then you compare them to an American family, African-American or kind of European, white, American, whatever. Like what you'll find is those traditional communities, which is often mistaken as racism or xenophobia, it, they, they're, they're able to stick together because of what you're talking about, because they have an emotional maturity, because the struggle which facilitated them having a need to kind of come and immigrate and all that stuff, or you see what I'm saying? That struggle cuts out all that stuff. And I'm, uh, let me let me even break it down more to get to what you're saying, um, Cyprian, so you understand what I'm saying. One of the things that always used to drive me crazy is to talk with my friend Rodney about that. Rodney, not great guy, who used to run this thing called the man, the man class, um, which was all about, he, you know, the, the tagline was teaching males become men and really like soft skills and teaching dignity, respect, all these things. He'd always talk about, and this was just a common thing, black, get a bunch of black people together, whatever, bunch of black guys. And then here's the thing. The one guy who's got the master's degree has the job, has his family together, is trying to get everyone together and be like, okay, man, here's what you do. You do this, you do that. There's always like one joker who's trying to influence everyone. Who he, who, who does he think he is? Sure, sure. Like, why is he the boss? It's like, you can't read. <laughs> you can't read. You're, you know, you, you've never held an apartment on your own besides trying to bed down a woman. You know what I'm saying? And you, the one guy who's doing something, that's that crab in the barrel mentality that's prevalent. And the reason why it's there, it isn't has nothing to do with phenotype. It has nothing to do with coming from the continent of Africa. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with these things that have facilitated these emotional issues because the emotions are not exactly, but they overlap and interpenetrate with the passions. So someone who is emotionally stunted is someone who's passionate. And someone who's, who's passionate is emotionally stunted. It's the difference between Spock and- um, Kirk. Kirk. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, 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 it, and it, at best, at best. Sure. You know what I'm saying? But the reality of this is like what you're talking about, Cyprian, that reality, you see it in the microcosm of, you know, in the neighborhood, right? And this whole like one-upping, and, and, and it's absurd. And, and it's this kind of immature bravado peacocking that's purely based in emotions and purely the, it's rooted in the passions and plays out through the emotions and the emotional dysregulation, the emotional, in, um, um, immaturity, all that stuff. So I have to ask, <clears throat> being a white guy, uh, have you know who's spent a good amount of time with I black people? I had not noticed. I had not noticed that about you. Oh, that is your bad because I wear it on my sleeve pretty hard. Like <laughs> I am, I am about one of the whitest guys you know. But um, is do you think that there like is it recognized that like the peacocking that people are lying like when it comes to those type of situations? Because I remember one time in my House on days as a drunkard, I was down, uh, I was uh, donating plasma. And I remember like there was two dudes sitting on a bed next to each other. They're both black and they're talking and they were 
they did not look like they were doing very well financially. Old bratty shoes, torn up clothes, stuff like that. And they're both sitting there and talking to each other. But I don't even need to do this. Like, I don't even I'm just doing this because, you know, like, you know, why not? It's my day off work, whatever. I'll get 30 bucks for donating some plasma. Like, I don't care. Like, I don't need to do this. Like my car is sent back. Like, but I was wondering, like, do each other do they know each other are lying? Like, is this like a thing where like they know? But I don't, th- but I don't think that's a racial thing. Like, I think I, that's a, about to I say, think it's a class. I think no, it's a no, no, class no, this thing. Is, of course, yeah. it's not and a this race is the thing, thing at all. It's yeah. a total class thing. Yeah, it's a yeah. So it's a class thing. So whatever. Okay, yeah, I got Dale Earnhardt's like cap in my trailer. You know, whatever. Yes. Like, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. The peacocking, whatever it is. Is this like a? Is this like a? The other person knows that they're lying, and the other person knows like that they're lying. You know, well, like all, yeah, well, but you can't you can't call them out on it because but, they're in the they're at the same place that you're exactly, at, right? Exactly. So, all, see, here's the thing: all society is functioning like that. All society outside of Christ is functioning like that. It's probably even worse in the upper echelons of things. Oh, you know what? I I'm gonna tell you. Okay, having <laughs> having been in the Vegas culture and around people who like. A-list celebrities who mm-hmm. like people's names who they would know and hanging out like billionaires. You know what I mean? Like people who have a legit billion dollars and then people who have like $300,000, you know what I mean? In their bank account, mm-hmm. you will hear no bragging from the billionaire mm-hmm. about their money. Right. Zero. Yeah. Right. Zero, zero. They will never right. talk to you about their finances. You will never hear it. The $300,000 guy. Oh, he's, he's nonstop. Right. And, and like, stop. look, this this plays which, out. Oh, sorry, Father, which is how I know Andrew Tate doesn't really have all that much money, because if he did, there would he wouldn't have had the need for all the the Bugatti and all of that and mm-hmm. saying but all that. Isn't, That's how I know. But isn't that also like a classic hallmark of new money? So he could have that money, yes. but he just recently got it. No, because- no, no. See, I th- I think the thing about new money is like the whole thing about new money is you don't actually have all that much money. Like you just have never had money before. So Hmm. you think that you think you're rich. Hmm. Like you think you're rich because you've never really had money. But old money has like, you know, you you, you take it's like old money has hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland, right? Now they're not going to tell you about the hundreds of thousands of acres that they have. And it's like, there's not even a valuation on it, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, it's wealth. Let's, it's, it's wealth. It's wealth. It's old, like, money ha- old money yes. is wealth. And yeah, they and don't even know how much their ranch that, in Wyoming right. is worth. It's been in the family for 10 generations. They and, don't and even I, know how much it's worth. And I got to say, it's one of those things which it's interesting how he's faded away. We'll see what happens. But it's interesting. It's one of the few things where it was just like what Kanye was talking about, certain things. If you cut through so much with just the 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 jester you know the fool if you, if you just cut through all that that was one of the things that we talked about which is like if you if you knew what he was saying it's like there, there's something real there because people don't understand this distinction between you know being rich and having wealth because what you're talking about is wealth wealth doesn't wealth is almost like a whole other ontological category it's like it's a completely it's a completely different thing and wealth and like being rich are just the two totally different things. And I would even say this, it, it just permeates someone's being because it, it even, it affects, it's the worldview. It affects how they interact with everything. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that wealth is something that isn't, you can't be wealthy and be wealthy overnight. Wealth one of the one of the you know kind of inherent qualities of wealth is that it's old and so because it's old even if you're like the punk kid who's doing whatever at the end of the day you know at some point in time i imagine they know at some point in time unless they're really way out there that that car is going to get pulled and they're going to have to be like okay you know what i mean sure like the game's over whatever oliver queen's done like This is this is where it says in the Bible it talks about when you sit with a king, put a knife to your throat. You know, because the reality is, is when you're when you're dealing with real power and real wealth, 
so much of what you see people talking about and yammering on about there there it's it's a completely different system and game that that they're dealing with and i just want to kind of bring it back home that's that's where culture isn't just about the affect because there is something about the reality of how it builds in certain um modes of being particularly around like the emotions right because look getting to some of the things Andrew's saying like oh you don't eat this at that time you don't drink this at that time one of the great hallmarks of poverty is and what we're talking about this kind of poverty culture which transcends race whatever impulse mm. impulsivity Lack of impulse control. Lack of impulse control. Well, and the question is, which comes first? Does the lack of impulse control lead to poverty, or does the poverty lead to lack of in- impulse control, or is it the or is it a feedback loop? Well, I think it's a feedback loop, but I I would say it starts off with the lack of impulse control leads to the poverty, because you see a fool and his money, and they're soon parted. Right here. Right? right, and so that has everything to do with because you can take someone who's in poverty. But if they start getting certain qualities, that's where you hear about people marrying up. That's why this whole thing about and and that's why it really like eh, this is this is this is getting complicated because on the one hand it is, and on the other hand it isn't. And what I mean by that is this: you see people marrying up, and they, that's 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 just a thing, right? But people who really marry up, they understand what that means. It isn't just about oh. I, my wife is a little bit smarter than, or she's prettier than me or something like that. They understand that they're marrying into a family. That's why the whole thing about guarding bloodlines and all stuff is a thing, because let's, let's talk about it this way. I was just telling, you know, I'll, I'll use my family as an example. Like I was just telling uh, my, my 15 year old, Oh, this right here, that um, this kind of like mischievousness that you see uh, in your in your siblings and stuff that that's a qual's trait you get that from me you get that like from my side of the family kind of being a provocateur being mischievous you know pushing button like right this other thing which i won't name i was like but this other trait you know you get that that's a bordeaux thing meaning that his mom's side right and it's like that's a whole thing because you don't just marry your wife as you understand you're marrying her mom her dad, they're, you're marrying family systems, right? And those family systems, they have their own strengths and weaknesses in regards of, you know, emotional character traits, intelligence character traits, like all that stuff is real, right? Can it be, can it be transcended to a certain degree? Absolutely it can to a certain degree, but I don't think it's necessarily about transcending it. It's a matter of, is there a, what is the potential to work in synergy with it and have some of those things be either complementary or compensated for, right? Because you have to do one of the two things and everyone has that. I don't care how great you are. Everyone is going to have some something that they need to learn to be in complement with or to compensate for. But this thing of like emotional, um, emotional intelligence, that's that's a real thing. But the good news about emotional intelligence is that it can be um, developed. You know, emotional intelligence isn't something kind of like built in inherently biologically that you can't overcome. You know, there are aspects of emotional intelligence, which also means, and this is a real thing, um, personality can and does change. Right. But clearly, but you have to, but the, the problem with, with it and the the problem with saying that and the problem for people is they'll beat their head against the wall and they'll just feel hopeless because they they're not tackling this small portion of emotions and emotional development emotional control mm-hmm. you know emotional maturity this really is I, i'm not i'm not trying to put it forward like it's a panacea but in some degree kind of the context that we're talking people who are coming out of some degree of pretty intense secular culture life coming into a traditional culture, a spiritual context. You got to understand that this is something that you, that you have to be aware of. Even if you don't have quote unquote, a problem, 
you still should look at it because there's a lot of things getting back to what you're talking about in regards of being able to like cooperate, you know, like yeah. get together, get something done. The problem is, is if you're always the guy who is insecure, mm -hmm. even though you got the job, you got the wife, you got all the things, you know what I mean? But there's still some unresolved stuff and you're insecure. And that is always, that app is always playing in the background, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to motivate your interactions with people imperceptibly. And this isn't necessarily a spiritual thing, right? We're talking about on the level of like, it's, it, it is on the level of psychosomatic, yeah. right? And tackling this is one of the best ways to actually get into the spiritual, you know, the, the real spiritual meat. But a lot of people, they, they're not aware of it. And so they don't deal with it. And so they either A, find themselves spinning their wheels. And this is where Prelist kind of starts coming into play because someone mm -hmm. thinks they're, they're spiritual, this and that's like, you know, they're doing the Jesus prayer. Their wife walks in. It's like, what are you doing bothering me? I'm I'm praying. It's like, okay, when someone, and that happens to people. Yeah. When that happens, that's it's a happened, sign. It's like, happened to me. I've never gone that far, but I've definitely felt it. Yeah, for sure. That's some emotional work needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Because if you're really praying, someone can come in with a gun. You're like, all right, mm -hmm. let's go. You know what I mean? If you're really praying and it's like your wife comes in, it's like, I need help with the baby. You're like, okay. And you're praying as you're changing diapers. Like, you know, you're, you're not even having to say the words, like force yourself because your awareness of the presence of God is there. That's what prayer is. This Ultimately. is the, this is the peace, right? In peace, let us pray. This is in the peace. peace of, yeah. In this peace. Is the peace. Okay. In peace. My peace I give to you. Not as mm. the world gives it to you, do I give it, Right. Cause it's not, it's not the yogic. Um, I have no troubles. Right. Has, in, in fact, it's right. quite the opposite. Right. It's quite the opposite. You're, we you're measure here. peace in the light of suffering and strain and tension. Keep thy mind in hell and despair Keep, not. That's it. That's mm. it. So, Father, how would you, so how would you reconcile that? And it is of course going to be reconciled, but take the kingdom by force, you know, like, because like sometimes when I'm praying, like it feels like that the um, the battle is is I guess intense, and I feel like if I would get interrupted, like any prayer I had, well, I haven't snapped at my wife or whoever in a long time for praying for interrupting me while I'm praying. But like if I were like quote unquote like struggling to maintain like my prayer, and someone came in, and as I'm changing diapers, like I feel it leave. Is that prelist as well? You know what I mean? Are you saying what I'm saying? Because like, I'm struggling to try and take the kingdom by force. You know, so like- So here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's best to understand that that verse out of Matthew, um, having everything to do, and like, let's say with like asceticism, right? Like, oh, okay. Okay. Like it. it's always the fathers and the saints. They're always merciful with others and strict and brutal with themselves okay so then i have to ask because this afternoon i very much had this thought of like i tell people sometimes and i and i actually question for myself for the first time if this is a good thing to tell people show the same grace you would show to other people to yourself so if you i like i tell people sometimes if you were sitting outside of the situation looking at you you would be telling you, calm down. It's okay. You're not, you know, just like, take it easy. Yes, you messed up, but we move forward. Is that like something that I should be telling people in the sense? Because so let me ask you a question. Because is it essentially treat others the way you want to be treated? Is that essentially what you're saying? No, 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 no. It's more like a Are you person. inverting it? You're inverting it? I think. Maybe treat I Treat yourself am. the way you treat others? more yeah maybe but it's like if if you were to observe the situation happening to another person and you're being really really hard on yourself like if if somebody else had done the situation you wouldn't be as hard as you are like there's so some, I, uh i i don't know if you I'm should be harder on yourself right father you yeah should be harder yeah because yeah, other people because i want i want to highlight this because because you know i run into this often and this is one of those things where you know i know it's tough for people to hear but 
people who are like, it's like get this, like, I'm really actually just really like tough on myself. And I really have this, I got, uh, like, I'll hear it for a little bit so that we can build some rapport, but I'm waiting for the opportunity to tell them the truth, it's which pride. is, uh, the real problem actually is like, you, you favor yourself. You, you're, you're in love with yourself. And like you saying that ha- is just more of your like self-love and like, so pity so pity is self-love yeah you know what i mean and like yeah. i'm just like no 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 it's the opposite actually like you're actually not hard on yourself actually because it's not about being hard on yourself it's just about being honest because when people become masochistic on themselves that's still a weird inverted self-love it is because here's the thing the soft word that break a, a, a soft word can break bone or, or excuse me a gentle word turns away wrath and a, and a soft tongue can break bone. Yes. Because those those same people, you know, I'll almost say it with an absolute, sure, there is the exception, which proves the rule. There is the exception of the person who really is significantly damaged psychologically. We're not even talking about them. But this affect that a lot of people have picked up over the last 15 years of like, you know, Oh, I'm just really hard on myself, like all that stuff. You tell them just a little bit of just honesty. And they'll snap at you. And they just, they come undone. What you shared with them, the gentleness of that word is more brutal than the whole, like, I have to just, you know, the drama of just tearing at themselves and gnashing at themselves. They're, they're still, the self is still at the center of it. Sure. But the hum, but humility, the hum, remember the, the on ramp of humility. You know, honesty, right? Understanding humility is honesty. The honesty, which is humility, undoes that, right? And so, it, so no, it, it's not a thing. Forgive me, just from my experience, it, it's not a thing of that. It's that's why you know I still let's. It's good to try to stick with what the Lord says in regards to these things. He says, treat others the way you want to be treated, and I think that's really good because. Oftentimes you'll see when people have these emotional issues, right? And these are these other issues. They're really keen on just letting it fly with other people. And I get it. There is a measure of lack of self-control because we are dealing with, with biology because they have years and years of functioning a certain way. And so if someone's functioning a certain way for, you know, three years, it's going to take three years or less to really rewire some stuff, you know? Sure. But at the end of the day, right, once you get past the biology of, you know, um, neurological pathways and getting them rewired, which is a thing, right? Once you get past that, it really gets down to like the spiritual reality of not being able to see ourselves in an honest light. So that's when someone's actually done that work. So let me give you an example. Typically speaking, you need 90 days to rewire your brain to get out of, let's say, porn addiction. You got to have 90 day sobriety and to, to allow everything to kind of like the habitual aspect, the neurological aspect to really get yourself, okay, I'm, re- I'm for the most part kind of rewired. And again, I'm sure there's some exception out there that proves the rule, whatever. Sure. But once you do that and that person's kind of like on their way and they're just beginning to like deal with life, instead of being a walking skinned me, one giant skinned me that the slightest thing just kind of like cause them to lose their mind. Then they start realizing, oh, this is what it means to feel frustrated in a normal way. Oh, this is what it means to be um, concerned in a normal way. Those, those emotions, they come back in a way that as, you know, to be frank, you know, they were intended to function. Because sure. emotions aren't bad, but because of the fall, these emotions get out of whack and they become, you know, it's like I was saying, like I say, emotions are like angels, you know, angels, angelos means messenger. So they're either going to be holy angels that are there to communicate something to you, or they're going to be demons that are wanting your worship. Sure. And so the person who is struggling with emotions the deem their emotions are like demons and they want to be worshiped. They want to be, they become idols. So you begin to just respond to the emotion. I feel a certain thing. And then like, this becomes all encompassing to you and you can't even logically think you can't see things for sure. what they are. Sure. But 
the problem isn't emotions. The problem is that the emotions are out of control. They need to be brought to a place. There's a disorder. Of, of They're disordered. Yeah. They're disordered. So I guess what I was trying to say, I know you've got something to say, Cyprian, but the it, I've said before that there's a band Idols and they have a song where the lyrics are like, if someone talked to you the way you did to you, I'd put their teeth through. And I was like, do you see what I'm saying? Like, don't be so hard on yourself like that. And now I'm starting to actually see like, that's where the question came from is like, okay, maybe that's not such a good thing to be telling people. Like maybe actually honesty because like father. I would just roll with honesty yeah, because it's the safer bet because in in certain contexts, unless you're like really going deep and long with someone like, you know, you don't really know. And it's safer to say most people, they just need the, they're not, because here's the thing, they're not going to hear be honest from anyone. Yeah. You know, their therapist yeah. isn't going to tell them no. that, no. you know what I mean? No one, their spouse, their girlfriend, like no one's going to tell them to be honest. No one, no one wants that. Right. I think it was, um, someone's going to, I think it was Dostoevsky. He says that um, essentially like flattery is the easiest thing in the world to do. Telling the truth is the hardest thing in the world. And it's so true. It's yeah. so true. And so just telling someone, look, man, just be honest. You know yeah. what I mean? Father on, that, on that, on that note, like, and I think that I, I'm thinking of my, like, it goes back to the collaboration thing, like the, the, who can you collaborate with? Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking about my my strongest, like the professional relationships that I have that feel the most like alliances that are like the most powerful and with the most powerful individuals, like where the two of us working together can or three or four can get a lot done. One of the things that seems to be said at a pivotal point in those relationships, and I can say this with all of my most potent business relationships who have become like who I consider men who I consider to be like my brothers is that there's some point there where it's like hey listen here's what here's what it is if I'm ever messing up if I'm screwing up and you see me screwing up don't pull punches like it's actually the reverse of what you're saying Andrew Mm -hmm. like it's like something is said between the two of us always it always happens and this is when I know like oh we're like in a real this is we're going to battle together we're going to stand next to each other as they're like if you see me screwing up even if no one else says it you better tell me yeah you better be brutally honest and tell me how i'm messing up don't pull punches Mm -hmm. even if you're wrong and i'm gonna do the same Mm -hmm. and i actually um that's actually I've run into that a couple times with people from you know different parts of my life where it's like when you get into your first argument or conflict mm-hmm. with a person say you've met known a person like maybe six to nine months and they did something really kind of maybe insensitive or blah mm-hmm. blah blah and it, and it actually like hurts you um it's like it it's like no that's like the first sign of your guys's relationship deepening like that's mm-hmm. actually like, that's actually a really good thing that very first conflict when that comes into place you're like oh wait no things are getting deeper and wider because now we're not just being nice to each other. Like my good, good buddy, Nathan, like I am not afraid of calling him on any, on anything. Cause like, I don't need to really explain like where our relationship is. I can like, I can look at him and be like, yo, you know, come on, come on. But, I, but I mean, I think there's like, I agree. There's the level where like, oh, this person did something. And so now we're going to like reconcile that between the two of us, right? Like sure. there's something happening in our relationship Woo, that hurt my feelings, what you did. Now we're going to reconcile that. Okay, yes, that makes it deeper. I think I'm talking about something that's a little bit different. What I'm talking about is I'm talking about like, this is a person that I'm allied with. This is a person whose alliance to me like matters, right? And they do something that doesn't affect me. But I see that it's going to, that it's them making the wrong move, right? And what I'm going to say is oh, going I'm... to dire- and this is these are skilled people. I miss these are you, experienced, skilled, powerful people, right? Who have who have their own thing going. Who, if someone else came along and said something to them about it, they would be like, they have haters, right? But I'm going to come and say something to them that if it was from anybody else, immediately would be taken as, oh, this is a hater saying it. But I'm going to come and say something that it's like, I'm actually something that's not my business, right? 
And I'm going to be like, hey, dude, I saw what you did over here. I'm just letting you know, like, I don't think that's it's, it's not a good move, dude. Like, and here's the reasons why, like, that's not going to be good. And I'm expecting them to do the same for me and to call me on my call me on my BS, even if it doesn't affect them. Right? Yeah. So actually to be harder on me, to be as hard on me as a hater, but to actually be speaking the truth. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that for me is like that somebody in the battle metaphor. That is someone that like I want standing next to well, me. Well, see, here here's the problem. Um, and this is, you know, uh it's very difficult because number one, people are gonna hear this and they're gonna want to be like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're gonna think that they want that. That's that's yeah. And, and this is why, forgive me, I, I'm not trying to intention, but like, I got to bring it back. This is why it's like you, that sounds good. And it is good because people can feel and sense the truth of it. But this is why you need to be aware of like, you're emotionally, you need to be humble and honest. You're not oh, there. Yeah, that's, the, that's, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the second that's part, dude, is that the you're first time, the first time they say that too, because yeah. the, the commitment that you're making, I thank you, father. Yeah. Because I did leave that I did leave that part out. That is the corollary. Yeah. Yeah. You are making the commitment yeah. that you are going to stow your emotions when they say that. Yeah. That's yeah. and that's really hard to do. Yeah. I mean, I I will I will say it's like I don't even think it needs to go. I think it I don't even need to say it, it goes without saying about I could talk all day about this because the the thing about it is is really what's at stake. Like for me, there's this whole thing about, you know, this is, I can't speak. I don't know. I've, I've read books. I've seen videos. That's all fine and dandy. Here's the reality. The reality is, is that, you know, I'm an American. I have this whole situation. I'm a convert, blah, blah, blah. But I'm still a priest. And it kind of doesn't matter if somebody wants to say, well, you're a convert. It doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, guess what? You can say it like you want all day long, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna face God on it. It, it. it it literally does not matter what you say. I don't care if you say I, you've been priest for 50 million generations, doesn't care. I'm going to face God now, for better, for worse for it. And so what that means is the inability at times to do that, even though that's what's needed, it's a heavy weight. Because it's like, how do you tell someone's like, you have no idea. There's this whole other series of things behind this this door that you're so like you don't want to walk through this one door. And it's like, let me tell you, baby girl, let me tell you, son. Like everything in every fiber of my being wants you to get through this. Because look, I don't even have to fake altruism. I know my next on the line about this. Sure. And like, yeah, I love you, but also too, I fear God. Right. And so if I'm scared about you just losing your mind because, you know, not because I got into something heavy. That becomes really difficult. And so I think this is a, this is a big reason why people should I, I hope people really take this into account. And it's not about like, OK, like I'm going to be tough and like emotionally tough. It's like, no, no, no. Just start being honest and humble. Right. Because it's one thing to be like, I can't deal with this but I need to, that's, that's okay. Versus someone who's just like making excuses or putting smoke screens or doing this and that, you know what I'm saying? Because as long as you're putting smoke screens, as long as you're saying it's not the thing, as long as you think that you can eat meat when you're really needing to be on milk, you have a problem. Yeah. This so is, this is, this is obedience. This is why the practice of like now I'm seeing, now I'm seeing why learning to be obedient, like to a spiritual father, spiritually obedient, for instance, why that is like such good training for being obedient to the father mm -hmm. when it's the time to be hu humble, mm -hmm. right? That it's like, oh no, this humility is in obedience. Like, forgive me, I, I'm father, I don't know if I could do humility without the obedience part. Forgive me, I'm going to cut you up because I've, I've talked about it before, but I can't say it enough. I can't say it enough. Like, I'm sure someone has some sort of obscure tax that they want to show me to be something different. That's fine. God bless them. I'm just telling you, when you're in confession, it's a mini judgment. Hmm. And so that's why I work really hard with people 
started justifying and this and that. And it's just like, I'm like, hey, no, no. Gently trying to be like, sometimes not so gentle, depends. Hey, you got to look at this, blah, blah, blah. What they don't understand is like, this is a mini judgment. <laughs> you do like, you need to learn now what it means to not make excuses and sin. Like it isn't an option. It isn't one of those things like, ah, maybe I'll get it. Maybe I'll get it. Like there's certain things that you have to get. There's well, certain things that like, you need to get this to a certain degree before, because who knows when you die, right? You, you So it's one thing to be working on something and then maybe you didn't make it, but God's not judging our success. He's judging our efforts. You see yeah. what I'm saying? So like, if you're actually working on it, there's mercy and grace. But if you're just kind of like, because there's people who they would rather be comfortable in all the effort of making lies and justifications than the, than the ease of just going through the pain of telling the truth, but more importantly, hearing the truth told to them about themselves. Like that's, that's where the, that's where the money is, you know? Won't, won't that help with like um the toll houses as well because like if you that's, can that's all that's everything about the toll houses it, it, yeah, that's true yeah no that's not true i didn't do that you know like because then there's that whole confusion of like wait did i did i cheat on my wife you're like no i didn't cheat on my wife they're accusing me of that i know that's not true you know how i know that's not true because i know it's true like i know it's true to more to an extent about what happened with me so um the father cosmos has a story he's talking about he was with a bishop or something like that. And forgive me if I skew this story, but the, him and Father Cosmos talks a lot about him being overweight. I've never seen a picture of the guy, but he talks to himself about being overweight. And I guess this bishop was as well. And he's talking to the bishop about it. And he was like, yeah, you know, like sometimes it's a glandular thing. Sometimes it, you know, it's a body dysregulation. The bishop was like, no, I think I just like eating food. <laughs> and Father Cosmos talked about like what a breath of fresh air that was to just be like, that's the truth. Not like, yeah, I'm a big old fat, you know, like slob, you know, like, no, 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 no. Because now you've entered into Logos me because mm -hmm. like that thought pops into your head. Like that's not of God. But if you can say like, I am, I am like 40 pounds overweight. I am like 50 pounds overweight. Like I eat too much food. I don't know what there is. I mean, I'm going to work on it, but that's kind of it because and this is, we, we probably don't want time to go through all of this. Maybe this will be part two of this conversation, but fathers talk to me and I use it all the time. I can't specifically name Logos me, which is the struggle with the thoughts, but fathers talked about this example before. And I use it in counseling is, is like, if you start, if you're sitting there one day and you're like, man, my belt's starting to get a little bit tight, you know, like, man, maybe I'm putting a little bit of weight. And then, but the moment the thought enters your head, like you fat sack of crap, look at you, you're disgusting. Like then that's like a logos me, right? Father, like, okay. Moving from the first to the second. Yes. Yeah. And like it, and so, but that thought in and of itself might've actually been a good thing because maybe that was the thought that got you to the gym. Maybe mm -hmm. that was the thought that, the, you know, that thought popped in your head and you put back the third piece of fried chicken or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, like. You're like, I'm actually going to start doing something. But the minute that like the you fat sack of crap pops and then suddenly you're on fire because you're like, oh, my. Oh, my gosh. Oh, and then you're starting to justify it. And you're trying to like, oh, well, what do I do? And you actually end up eating more chicken then because you're stressed. You know, you're stressed. Well, you, because you like give up like I'm, I'm in despair. Like, forget it. Then. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just want to yeah. say that's also important. I want to make this correlation. Because I speak about this word, I just want people to hear this really carefully because hopefully they made it through to this point. But that's this this part's key in understanding that the whole thing of like, well, the issue isn't really that you're too that you're like too hard on yourself. The issue is that you're not being honest, right? That's there. The other side of that though is a lot of people are dealing with thoughts which aren't theirs. So I have to add that in there. Yes. A lot of people are dealing with thoughts that aren't theirs. And so understanding that is really key because there are a lot of people who are, shame is not bad. Toxic shame, you know, that's a different thing. There's a lot of people who they deal with the accusation of the demons and the demons take the form of 
your mom who just couldn't get off your back. You, you know what I mean? Those things, the demons will use them. They'll, they become the arrows in the chariot the demons ride in on. And so those accusations, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. That's something where you need God's mercy and, and you need help with that. I'm talking about something else that is rooted in the kind of, you know, narcissistic, and I hate using that term, but, you know, it, it just explains a lot, the kind of narcissistic milieu that we find ourselves in through everything we consume, what we listen, what we watch, what we read, you know, all of that. So that's like the, a lot of times when I'm, I'm working with someone in addiction, they'd be like, I'm the biggest piece of crap there is. It's like, no, you're about an average size piece of crap. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't met the biggest one yet because mm -hmm. like the fact that you think you are number one, the, and not even, it's like an inversion of, huh? I wonder if it's a, it's, it's like a, it's like a gross inversion of I'm the chief of all sinners. You it know? is a, it is an inversion of it because it's a lot like the guy, you know, the guy who's um, he's not sharing, he's bragging. <laughs> yeah. It's like the guy who's like, he's not sharing in, in a repentant sense of what he's gone through in his rock bottom. He's bragging everybody how about how much of a bad boy he was. You know what I mean? It's not the it's not the same thing. I call I call it the list. When someone walks in and the first thing they say is, I've died three times, I've I've OD'd yeah. six times, you know, da da da. And I was just like, yeah. okay, be quiet. Um, so I, I have one more question. Cyprian, do you have any thoughts? Surely you got some thoughts. I, I well, honestly, like this has been a very kind of edifying, it's opening a lot, it's it's opening up a lot for me. Like I, I feel like this opened up a lot of I think just this idea is it, it well it opened I'll I'll finish the thought. It opened up a lot of the parables that our Lord said like about well there's so many that are about servants. Mm -hmm. Right? So so many of them and it's just like and 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 just this thought as I'm thinking about because I'm not a humble person, right? And like I've also programmed myself out of as people who who know my background like I'm, I don't have a lot of shame, right? I've, I've put myself in positions that most people would absolutely be mortified. Mm -hmm. Like even the thought of them being in that position would, mm -hmm. would like give them a heart attack, the thought of it, right? And those became normal to me, right? So I'm not somebody who has a lot of shame in the way that people would like think, think of it that way, you know what I mean? So it's not, it's, it's not to be like that. So it's like, Humility can be very has has is a struggle for me, but but strangely, it's not a struggle when it's obedience. If that makes sense, like like when it's when it's um like I, can tell I don't you even why, though. go I ahead can tell you go why. ahead go ahead because it's there's and that's the that's the kind of switch that needs to flip for everybody ultimately is that when you begin to desire God and desire the good over how, over how you're feeling, to be really frank. And forgive me, but like that gets back to emotions where when you are so centered on, you can't stand being uncomfortable, that's the first thing someone needs to learn. You have to learn to be uncomfortable just a little bit. Because if you never learn that, you'll you'll never mature. And if you never mature in these areas, there is a real interplay with the with the emotions and the spiritual. They're not the same, but they do interpenetrate. And so not being able to be uncomfortable with something is super dangerous. This is this is important, Father, because that is, yes, that is something that for whatever reason, I am accustomed to being uncomfortable. Right. I'm good at being un I'm good at being uncomfortable, but it but it also makes it but shame is also it. So so this is the trade off, I think, for me sometimes, you know what I mean, is that I, you can't shame me into doing anything mm -hmm. like because like I have I, like the discomfort that most people would feel from like, oh, what is this person going to think about me? Oh, what is this person going to think about me? Oh, I'll never be accepted in my community or all of these things. There's no I like. That level of discomfort for me, it's like, obviously I'm past that. 
right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, so, like, it's like, <laughs> I've ruined you, my reputation more than anyone ever could. And look, I'm still fine. You know what I mean? Would, <laughs> like seriously. <laughs> would you like feel uncomfortable, Cyprian, if you were like, I like a family get together with maybe with like, and I don't know exactly know what your wife's family is like, but maybe like your mm. in-laws. Okay. Just the mm. universal in-laws. Right. And you like got maybe had a couple too many drinks and like you got into it with like, I don't know about politics or something like that mm-hmm. with like her uncle or something. Would there be shame like the next morning? Like, and you kind of made like an ass out of yourself just a little bit. And speaking from personal experience, without a doubt, like yeah. this, that was a situation I almost always felt ashamed that, when I got drunk and talked about the faith, like back mm-hmm. in my alcoholic days, every single morning I woke up the next day after having spewed about like the differences about like the Nicene Creed and stuff like that. Every like the next morning, I always wake up and be like, why did I do that? So is that something that you would like that uncomfort of like, no, I need to feel this bad feeling like. Andrew, if you knew the things that I have done a, a night of drinking um they they it is things that i simply could not there are things that i have done this is a in PG. that environment and been paid to do in, in at that which should be even more shameful right like which should be even on top of it that it's like oh and you lowered yourself to actually this is your profession that was my profession andrew <laughs> My profession was to do shameful things after a night of hard drinking. Ask. So, the, so the answer is like, for an instant, I'll be like, "Ha!" Huh. On it, and and that's honestly my response is that I would wake up and be like, and somebody be like, "Oh, did you know you did what? 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 I'll be like, "Oh, I did." Ha! Literally, Ask. that's it. Ask that's him. that's that's what my I'm thinking about it. That's my response is like, "Oh, that's funny. I did that. Okay." Yeah. Yeah, but 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 it is. But, but the, the obedience, the obedience, because, because there's great abundance. Like, I think that that's the other thing that has, that has come and why I'm willing to be obedient and why it's been so real is that like, in that, in that obedience is like, then you, then you don't have to do those things. And because at the end of the day, did I really want, no, those, I, I would wake up every morning feeling poisoned. You know the feeling, right? But it's like poisoned th- throughout. Yeah, I mean, every night I knew that I had done something. Because terrible, there's right? the thing is, is that there's a searing of your conscience that happened. Yeah, and it it wasn't like a natural. You had to work to get there, and it wasn't. Yes, exactly. It wasn't something that God didn't make you that way. Exactly. It's not something that was like you, you know what I'm saying. It wasn't some sort of like uh, virtue. Right. And so we, and this is where this is repentance, right? We, God opens our eyes. We, we see these things and, and then that repentance, repentance is the most powerful thing in this world because it literally turns lead into gold, Mm. you know, um, that, that work of repentance and, and the, the transfiguration, the transmutation of, elements into into such a thing that they bring you know they reflect you know god and and i i think it's really important to really kind of make the point here about you know our minds and our hearts being the place where god dwells we need to have the mind of christ and our hearts need to be circum circumcised and these things need to be done so that we could be indwelt with the Holy Spirit because that is life. You know, in that in that work, the mystery and the meaning of the Bal Kosovo, St. Nikolai talks about, you know, there's the, the heavenly spirit, which is, you know, the spirit of man that has the Holy Spirit. But then there's the natural spirit, which is essentially like an animal. You know, and an animal, when an animal dies, you know, animals have emotions, but when they die, they die. They don't have a generative eternal spirit. You know, they don't, they don't have that. They have soul, but their soul is, is, is on the level of emotions and that's it. And, and human beings will have that. And then there's the demonic spirit. And the demonic spirit is the one that becomes depraved, the one that, that um, learns to feed on the negative energy, the, the anti-life force. And those who begin to feed on that, they 
they begin to experience the hell of it, you know? Um, and repentance is so powerful because it can take someone who's been charged and in, in feeding off of that demonic spirit and get them to where they begin to desire and hunger for the Holy Spirit and with God's help become a vessel that can bear the Holy Spirit. Because I'll tell you something, um, people don't understand this, but once you start living a life of repentance, you get it and it isn't cliche. Uh, it's it's the tougher man we were talking earlier about who's the baddest guy here you know the indians and all that stuff and the the tougher one is the one who can bear the holy spirit it's hard work to bear the holy spirit of god it, it takes real strength it doesn't take strength to bear a demonic spirit it takes strength to bear the holy spirit and that's why repentance that's why our prayer, that's why our tradition, our fasting, um, our ascetic practices, they are what they are because they're necessary to encounter the Holy God. And they're necessary to become a vessel that can hold his Holy Spirit. I, I just have to say really quick, you almost sound like you said the anti-life equation for a second. And I wouldn't be angry if I didn't point that out. So, yeah. Jack Kirby was on some next level stuff. I'm just saying, like, the whole, like dark side mm -hmm. like dark yeah. side's ultimate man dark side's ultimate wish is to take away human free will mm -hmm. like that's is, is the anti-life equation is finding the anti-life equation and it's so interesting when you find out like what father told me just within the last couple of years anti means in place of rather than against so it's like it's a different life he wants a different life for people mm -hmm. um Man. The Matrix. The Matrix. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's this really funny panel I sent a long time ago to Father where it shows a factory on Apocalypse. And, it's, and there's a giant banner that says, To die on the job is to die for Dark Side. And yeah, that was pretty good. I like that. So, all right, gentlemen, we're coming up on two hours. Um, I didn't find an audience question in time that I feel like I knew well enough. Um, to throw out there so i'm going to ask as a closing question before i do our outro what is your least favorite ice cream flavor because i know mine is mint chocolate chip Same i here. do not like mint chocolate Same chip here. Can't pistachio. Stand pistachio pistachio and i love pistachios but i do not like pistachio mm. ice cream all right, yeah. so is this pistachio flavored ice cream or pistachio yeah. like as a sub dairy substitute pistachio flavored ice cream i did not even know that was a thing can't stand it is chip. it's not mint good. chocolate and chip mint chocolate chip no anything mint it. yeah i'm not mint to me mint is not a candy yeah mint is like something for my breath maybe that i might want yeah. after dinner you know i'll take I mean? a mint julep you know oh i have a mint wait julep. a minute wait a minute mojito Guys, I'm Hito has the muddled mint. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. I'm yeah, triggered. okay. There's there's some there's some oh yeah, you're triggered. I'm triggered. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just well, kidding. Well, but father, but what we're talking about there is different because we're talking about the actual mint plant. Yeah, it's yes. not mint. We're flavor. not talking about yeah. like the mint flavor. When they That's put like what... mint syrup in like a no. like a coffee drink or something like no. that. It's disgusting. Christmas time, the peppermint uh oh, peppermint I Starbucks. Hate peppermint. Yeah. Horrible. I hate it. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. horrible. It. gross well i'm glad we're all in agreement about that that's yes. nice um okay so no emotions involved <laughs> what no emotions involved there we could agree <laughs> indeed um so <laughs> that's it for us folks um so i found a whole pocket of emails i'd stashed away um at a different time in my life <laughs> so uh there's some there's some email still circulating out there and some of the you um unfortunately asked to get father's contact info so if i have not responded to you that's why and i'm going to try to work on it this week i'm just wanting to let everybody know at the recording at the time of this recording it is my sincere desire that this next week i make amends and i try and make things right for people reaching out and me not reaching back that's not right um i'm going to try a little bit harder to get back to those guys um other than that, uh, I want to thank Jack again for our thumbnails. That is incredible. Uh, you're doing a great job. It's a uh, killer. It. Um, 
like seriously like still my favorite one is still the one from a couple of ones ago where it shows like the saint in yellow or in gold and, and anthony say is oh saint yeah you told me that last Groundhog's time. day yeah it's that's a i saw that I was like that is perfect like i love yeah. that that yeah. that's great um it's my favorite so far um and then uh anytime we mention music on this which we didn't this episode generally speaking i think i'm almost caught up on we add it to a spotify playlist called royal path podcast music something like that mm -hmm. uh feel free to reach out as i mentioned earlier at andrew at royalpath.network um mm -hmm. uh i promise you know i'm, I'm going to try and get to that little pocket of emails i found um and uh if you have any questions want to get father's contact info please reach out i'll get back to you as soon as i can and then also our store royalpath.store mm -hmm. um it's uh got merch on there and we don't see any of that money uh, it goes to our parish two-thirds of it goes to the parish and one-third of it goes to the person who creates it um and other than that i think that's it uh thank you thank you for having a good night bye-bye bye-bye